So guys, this video is about a set of vintage lenses that I think are just about perfect for the micro four thirds or smaller type sensor cameras. Let's check them out, but first the obligatory test film to show off just what these lenses can do. Well, I hope you guys like that test footage. Anyway, if you wanna skip the story time here, check out the other chapter times or just skip to this time to start with our first couple of tests. Anyway, why these lenses? And yes, there are tons of vintage lenses out there, the vast majority of which can be adapted to the Micro Four Thirds mount. Well, after experimenting, buying a ton of vintage glass and testing them, I consistently ran into the two same problems. First off, I found it very difficult to find a set of lenses that actually matched in terms of color, aperture, character, and so on. And the second reason being finding an acceptably wide angle for a decent price seemed to be almost impossible. I mean, most affordable vintage wide angle lenses were about 28 millimeters or longer with only a couple exceptions. The problem is even on a speed booster, it's really hard to get a truly wide angle shot on that GH5 micro four thirds, two times crop factor sensor. Then I discovered these, the Kiev 16U 16 millimeter film camera lenses. They include a wide angle 12 millimeter, a standardish 20 millimeter, and then there's the 50 millimeter all at F2. I got all three and the adapter for under 200 bucks, but how are the final results of these lenses and how easy are they to use? Well, let's check it out. Okay, final disclaimer before we start the test to stick with me, it's important. Don't click away on the video, don't skip around. Okay, here it goes. These lenses don't actually cover the full micro four third sensor, but personally, I don't see this as an issue. And in fact, there are two easy workarounds. First, for the 12 millimeter and 20 millimeter, you can simply turn on the X teleconverter mode and 4K on the GH5. This introduces a further 1.4 times crop to turn these lenses into a 34 millimeter and a 56 millimeter. And you can just basically leave it on or turn it off for the 50 millimeter because it doesn't have any extra vignetting. Unfortunately, the GH5S doesn't have the spare pixels to do this. The reason you'd wanna do it in camera instead of in post is just to help with the workflow or be better for framing out those dark corners when it comes to composing your shots. Anyway, the second method is to shoot 4K, deal with those dark corners and just crop them in your timeline. I found out that the 12 millimeter needs to be at about 125% and the 20 millimeter I liked at about 115%. While again, the 50 millimeter is good right away out of camera. Comparing it to my Leica 10 to 25 to find the focal lengths, the 12 millimeters seems to be more like a 14 millimeter after the crop and the 20 millimeter seems to be a little closer to like a 25 millimeter. I mean, sure, you're gonna take the slightest hit in quality when exporting 4K footage in a 4K timeline out to 4K, but I think it's not that big of a deal. 25%, most people aren't really gonna notice. The downsides here are you definitely can't see your exact framing, especially on the 12 millimeter lens, but you end up getting a fair bit wider than just using the X teleconverter option. 
So of course these things are built with a very utilitarian Russian mindset and so are probably even a little hardier than your average vintage lens. They're also super tiny, which could be a pro and a con for different people. And I do appreciate that the focus and aperture rings have different textures and are consistent across the three lenses. At the end of the day, the build of these lenses is probably gonna be a mixed bag at best, being something you have to get over instead of something that's gonna be a benefit overall. Honestly, this stuff is kind of boring and I want to stay positive for at least the first half of this video. So I'm gonna go ahead and do a deep dive on the build quality and usability at the end of this video rather than here at the beginning like I usually do. So when it comes to image quality, obviously the 12 millimeter is gonna have a little bit of ghosting wide open, but there is a bit of center sharpness and of course those corners are looking pretty dark. 2.8, the sharpness is better across the frame, the darkness gets pushed back a little bit. And f4, you get even better sharpness and the ghosting is gone. At f8, you're ever so slightly sharper, but it's pretty negligible. And at f16, you're getting pretty soft with that diffraction kicking in. The 20 millimeter, we see a pretty similar story with that sharpness in the center, but with the ghosting taking away from it a little bit. At 2.8, the center sharpens up a little bit. The corners get a little bit brighter, but are still soft. F4 sees the center sharpening up again, and the corners finally getting sharper as well. F8, the center is actually a little softer, but it has the best corner to corner sharpness you're gonna find on this lens. And at F16, again, the image is soft. The 50 millimeter is the same story once again, some sharpness in the middle, some darkness in the corners, but the ghosting and edge sharpness is definitely a little extreme. F2.8, the ghosting is gone, the darkness is pushed into the corners, but those corners still are soft. F4 sees the best center sharpness again, and F8 sees the best corner to corner sharpness again. And going down to F16, and even further down to F22, the lens is gonna be pretty soft. Of course, when it comes to technical image quality, they really can't compare to a modern lens like the Leica 10 to 25, but you're not really getting these lenses for technical perfection, but you definitely need some level of competency when it comes to sharpness, and these lenses definitely have it in my opinion. A huge thing with these lenses is they do have the slightest amount of color shift throughout the aperture range and focal range combinations, but nothing even close to what I saw in my Helios 58 millimeter in my video pitting it up against the Voigtlander 42.5. I generally wouldn't worry about the aperture affecting the color too much and the lenses seem to match in general for the most part. The chromatic aberration in these lenses is actually pretty well controlled with that reasonable aperture of f2 so in general, chromatic aberration hasn't been much of a problem in any of my tests, but I did try to coax a little bit out of it with these leaves, just to show you guys what that was gonna look like across the lenses. I'm showing you the 50 millimeter here because it is definitely the most apparent on this lens, but they all breathe a fair bit. It's kind of par for the course when it comes to these older lenses, so I wouldn't worry about it too much unless you're a super big stickler when it comes to focus breathing. The 50 millimeter is a generally pretty great lens for fairly close up shots. It probably gets about as close as any 85, 100 millimeter equivalent portrait length you would find even in the modern day. And the bokeh I find is really interesting close up, but we'll talk about that later. The 20 millimeter disappoints a little. As a standard lens, like a 50 millimeter ish, you'd think it would be the easiest to get close up pictures, but it's actually a little bit worse than your standard nifty 50 in terms of filling the frame with your subject. In a bit of a surprise, the 12 millimeter actually has the best macro capabilities of all three lenses, even before the crop. And when you crop it to cover the frame, it's even better. I wouldn't really recommend shooting everything close up with this lens though, as the distortion would probably make some subjects, especially people, look pretty strange, but that could also just be what you're going for. So if you want people to look kind of strange, like some of these shots I did from a short film, 
this lens might be a pretty interesting lens for close-ups. I also should say that all of the lens's sharpness holds up pretty well, even wide open and even at the minimum focus distance. Many older lenses and even modern ones seem to be especially soft close up, so it's nice to see that these ones hold up pretty well. The bokeh here is definitely going to be a little subjective for sure, and in a modern lens, you'd probably be pretty disappointed in bokeh like this, but it sort of won me over. I mean, it's very strange having some of that outlining around the insides of the bokeh or the outsides of the bokeh only. There's some crazy blobs, and of course, all three lenses feature some pretty strong swirly bokeh effect, which is it's pretty popular among vintage lens enthusiasts, myself included. But just like many vintage lenses, it gives you a much more paintedly textured background than a modern lens like this Leica 42.5 would otherwise. Just very smooth backgrounds, nothing nasty showing up. And that might be good for some things, but it definitely says this is a really modern lens. These lenses definitely do have a dark side when it comes to bokeh though. And when you stop them down, most apertures smaller than f2 will feature a somewhat rare, weird ninja star shaped look in bokeh, which honestly is pretty distracting when there's bokeh highlights. But in normal circumstances, I find it's pretty, you know, I mean, it's definitely not as nice as wide open, but if there's no particular highlights that can show that shape off, it looks pretty much smooth. But again, if you can use these at f2, that's definitely much preferable when it comes to bokeh. So you saw a fair bit of the flares in the maze video at the beginning, but the flares here are just awesome. I mean, usually I test this as a technical performance and as a creative tool, but you don't buy a vintage lens set to see how technically well they perform against flare. They're all gonna be worse than like every modern lens you've ever used. So yes, from a creator standpoint, well, they have rainbows, weird jellyfish shapes, all kinds of super fun stuff. The only thing I could really say against them is that wide open, the loss of contrast is, it's brutal. I mean, it washes out all kinds of details in your images, so just be prepared for that. It's a, it's a strong flavor of flair. Stopped down, they get a little bit uglier too, because sometimes that ninja star from the blades can come out again, like we talked about in the bokeh section, but I don't know, it's not too bad. I, I, whatever. In terms of sun star, I still have really no idea what I'm talking about, so I'll just show you some examples and you can decide for yourselves. So what do you think, was it good? I don't know. Leave it in the comments below. How are the sun stars on these lenses? Would you get them for the sun stars? I don't know. So yeah, do they match? Uh, I think mostly the bokeh, the flares, they all look very similar to me, but the colors are off just that little bit. However, I don't think that's ever gonna be enough that anybody is gonna notice it and obviously could be fixed pretty easily with just a, uh, doing a custom white balance in front of your takes with like a white card or something. They get the seal of approval when it comes to matching, which is one of our biggest, biggest factors when it comes to if these lenses are gonna be usable for like cinema work or something like that. So, okay, so here's the real dark side of these lenses. First, it's all the inconsistent features. All of the focus rings and the aperture turn the same way, which is really nice. You don't always see that, but the 12 millimeter has a clickless aperture ring, but the 20 and 50 millimeters have a clicked aperture ring. And it's not like they're really nice clicked aperture, which is kind of soft and has like half stop or third stop increments. It's big chunky stops and they are full stops. Two to 2.8, 2.8 to four with nothing really in between. So I don't know. Kind of a bummer. I think there's there's probably a way to make these clickless, but I, I definitely am not the one to do that. This is a minor point, but the 50 goes down to f22, while the 12 and 20 only go to 16. So it just kind of annoys me from a pet peeve standpoint. Uh, after that, I would say the small size could actually be a real downside for certain situations. Um, Sometimes it's hard to get a good grip on the lens. If you're using a cage, it could be hard. And if you're rigging up this thing with a big cage and everything, 
that could just physically block using the lens. If you've got like the Panasonic 20 millimeter pancake, you might've already had an experience similar to that. And when it comes to modding these for Cine work with focus gears and stuff like that, it would be pretty hard again due to how small the actual aperture and focus rings are. There's not really much to grip onto. Speaking of modding for these lenses and cinema work, these lenses have a common filter thread, which is nice, but it is a very, very weird 35.5 millimeter filter, meaning you're gonna have to get specialized step-up rings. And for the most streamlined experience, you're gonna need three, one for each lens, so you don't gotta be screwing them out and unscrewing them and screwing them back in all the time. Another downside is the adapter. And don't get me wrong, it is a great adapter. It works well in everything. I have an affiliate link down below. So if you do get these lenses, definitely check out that adapter. But the problem is twofold. First, it is a pain to switch lenses. You need to use a special tool to unscrew underneath the adapter. There's a little screw that's down there. Once that is slightly loose, unscrew the lens itself, kind of like an M42 mount if you're familiar with that lens system. I am glad there is this locking mechanism down there for security because the M42 lenses would unscrew sometimes, but for the most streamlined experience, like before, the best thing to do would probably be to buy three of these adapters, one for each lens. They are slightly pricier than your average dumb adapter, but that seems to be required to me due to the locking mechanism, which he'd have to put in every single one of those. And then the caps. I mean, of course, this is a really old lens system. They're stuck on an old camera most of the time. So the vast majority or even all of them I've seen have no lens caps. That means rear or front. You can solve the front one again by getting the step up rings for all three lenses and getting specialized lens caps just for these. But you're going to be hard pressed to find any that have the rear or front lens caps included. I don't even know if rear lens caps exist for these lenses because they're you know, they probably generally were sold back in the day attached to the camera already and you wouldn't really have much need to take them off. I don't know. I guess this is just another reason you're going to want to buy three adapters eventually and just put three micro four thirds standard lens caps on the back of them because I don't think those Kiev mount ones really exist. In general, when it comes to buying these lenses, First thing I would do would be to use my affiliate links down below. I'm kidding, of course, I'm kidding mostly, but yeah, eBay is the best place to go when it comes to these lenses and my links do work, so yeah. Anyway, you can try to get these individually one at a time, but I think in general, your best bet would be to either buy them still on the camera, you could use it as a nice, you know, shelf decoration, or just buy the three already removed from the camera. That gives you the best chance in my mind of those lenses being made at the same time, treated the same way throughout history. So hopefully those characteristics will match just a little bit better than lenses bought separately. The second part is that adapter. There are a few from China I found, I'll link those, but I can't say for sure whether they're decent quality or not. They probably work fine. If you want the best adapter, however, you should definitely, the only way to go is RAF camera. He makes and sells these things, and I think he maybe sells the lenses on occasion too. Well, either way, those links are down below as well. Anyway, his adapter is the one I got, and it has a really tight fit, pretty much little to no play in the lens, and that is really important when it comes to focusing these things, because if they're shifting around, that usually looks pretty bad in your footage. Okay, so when you found a lens set that looks good, there's a few things to ask about or look into for the pictures they put up. The first is the killer of vintage lenses, and that is fungus. Many old lenses get left in like a soggy box and a basement and a few specks of water can grow into some serious mold problems over the years. Usually this comes up on the glass as little specks, almost like dust or a web of weird mycelium. Generally, it won't hurt to have a little bit, but keep in mind, it's not gonna do anything other than get worse over time. So keep that in mind. If you're willing to risk it, maybe bring it up to the seller. It might have them take the price down a little bit for you, but in generally, I would watch out for fungus, really be really vigilant when it comes to that fungus. I, it's the number one thing I look out for. Obviously, if there's any scratches or things like that, it can impact the image quality too, but usually it doesn't as much as people might tell you. 
Last thing I would look out for would be dents and scratches. If you dent a filter thread on one of these old lenses, it can be damn near impossible to pound back into place. And even worse, if it's on the barrel of the lens, it could make your focus ring super stiff and hard to turn or even impossible to move if the dent's bad enough. I think something like that happened to my 20 millimeter because the thread is dented and the focus is by far the hardest to turn on that. Although a little gun oil goes a long way when it comes to stuff like that. Look at all the pictures listed, ask for more if you need to, and ask as many questions as you think you need to before pulling the trigger. It'll be worth it. Spend the time and don't just make it impulse buy. Okay, so conclusion time. Are these a viable pick for a micro four thirds specific vintage set? Well, yeah, I mean, if you can't get over the need to crop a little bit, and if you need a specific setup where the small size won't allow you to operate the camera and lenses how you'd want, maybe look somewhere else. But in terms of creating a look and a vintage feel, while also getting pretty decent performance with a huge side of character, these lenses definitely fit the bill. They certainly aren't the easiest lenses to use ever, but for me, those shortcomings are 100% worth working around if the character and image of these lenses really appeals to you. I personally don't bring them out as much as I probably should, but I think that is because I haven't rigged them out with those step-up rings and extra adapters and stuff like that. They do solve my two biggest goals I had with finding a vintage lens set, which we talked about in the intro, giving us a reasonably wide angle and a consistent enough look across the image and aperture combinations. If a music video or short film comes along, you bet these things will be the first ones I reach for. Anyway guys, I hope you found that interesting and I hope this sheds some light on a relatively underrated and forgotten lens set. Remember, if you found the information in this video helpful and it informed your purchasing decisions, please, I would consider picking up a adapter and lens set using my affiliate links if I've got them set up. And if I don't, I'll put the links anyway. It's gonna cost nothing extra to you, but it will help this channel out a ton. Also, while you're down there looking in the description for those affiliate links, please feel free to hit the like button Leave a comment, let me know what you're using on your camera, if you're using a vintage lens set, and if so, which one. And while you're down there, also consider subscribing to get notified when my new video goes live. And I'll see you in the next video. Maybe that'll be another video. I'll kind of like uh, rig these things out, you know? Put the gears on them if I can, put the step up rings, just really show you how to you know, do a vintage lens set right and use it for like cinematic filmmaking stuff. What do you guys think? Also, what do you think of this two lens, lens, two camera setup? Was it cool? Did it work good? Did I even cut to this camera ever? We'll see. Subscribe. <laughs>